Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Ehrlich, and I'm the executive director of the Van Cortlandt Park Alliance, uh, and I'm also the park administrator. Van Cortlandt Park Alliance works to preserve, support, and promote the third largest park in New York City through educational, cultural, and stewardship programs. This past weekend, we celebrated Juneteenth in the park. The Enslaved People Project Task Force Steering Committee put together an event that honored the enslaved Africans who lived, worked, and died on the Van Cortlandt Plantation. You can watch a recording of the ceremony on our website, uh, vancortland.org. Tonight's presentation is a part of the Enslaved People Project. Van Cortlandt Park Alliance has been working closely with Van Cortlandt House Museum, Kingsbridge Historical Society, and a community task force on this effort to bring to light the history of slavery on the land that became the park through a variety of educational initiatives and activities. Please visit our website, vancortland.org, and our social media pages at VCP Alliance for more information. As we dive into this complex and difficult topic, it has been our honor to work with Cheney McKnight, who will talk with you tonight. Cheney is the founder and owner of Not Your Mama's History. She acts as an interpreter advocate for interpreters of color at historical sites up and down the East Coast, providing them with much needed on-call support. Not Your Mama's History consults with and helps museums, historical sites, historical societies, and private businesses in developing specialized programming about slavery and the African experience within 18th and 19th century America. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Cheney McKnight. Thank you very much for um, having, um, having me here. I am very passionate about talking about the ancestors here in uh, specifically New York City, but in general throughout New York State. So it's always wonderful working with Van Cortlandt Park um, Alliance. And it's always, you all are always very welcoming as well as Van Cortlandt House Museum. So thank you. Um, we can go ahead and put the um, PowerPoint up. Before I get started, I want to um, begin this program with a land acknowledgement to recognize indigenous people's communities. To acknowledge is to be aware of and appreciate. Land acknowledgement is a simple, powerful way of showing respect and a step toward correcting and centering the stories and voices of those often overlooked in history. Regardless of where you are within the United States, you are sitting on land that has been colonized. Let us ground ourselves in this recognition and also uplift the names of these lands and honor the community members from the nations who reside among us. For me, I am on the land called Lenape Hoking, home to the Munsi Lenape, the original stewards of this territory. Now, today, I am specifically focusing on um, slavery um, on the property of the Van Cortlands. Next slide. I think it's very important for me to start um, and recognize all that we do not know. I think looking at it as a puzzle is really helpful to really recognizing um, what we know and what we don't know. So um, all that we know about the enslaved here at Van Cortlandt is about 2% of a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, so when you're looking at a jigsaw puzzle, um, maybe we have some corner pieces that are put together maybe we kind of have an idea of where some of the pieces fit in the middle, but it looks very similar to this image here. Uh, there's a lot of empty spaces, but we can build um, a fuller picture from what we know here and other sites, so it can be very helpful. We know snapshots of how many were enslaved here in a span of maybe a year or two. We don't know all their names, we don't know which African ethnic groups they were a part of. We don't exactly know what jobs they were doing. Some we do. We don't know what meals they were eating, what clothes they were wearing, what religion they were a part of. 
We don't know their religious practices. We don't know the relationship they had with their enslavers. We don't know how many enslavers they had over the course of their lives. We do though have portions of this puzzle that are more complete from other sites. For example, we can look at places like the African burial ground. The remains we found there give us an insight into possibly the lives and the workload that the enslaved persons here were enduring. Also looking at Phillipsburg Manor is very helpful. And I would say the general experience of the enslaved in uh, New York colony and later the state um, really help us. Now my methods are looking at things like period journals, newspapers, correspondence, court documents, inventories, um, as well as um, research by um, uh, Nick Dimbowski from the Kingsbridge Historical Society. Nick has been so very helpful. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, and of course, um, there was a report done on the archaeology of the enslaved at Van Cortland Plantation um, by H. Arthur Bankoff and Frederick A. Winter. And that report has, I've relied heavily on that report as well to put together this presentation. Uh, so I would really want to say directly thank you to those who have um, provided me with your research. It has been very helpful in filling in this jigsaw puzzle. Next slide. It's important to note um, that the first people enslaved in North America by Europeans were indigenous peoples. There were over there were about two million people who were taken from the East Coast and forcibly uh, shipped throughout the Atlantic down into the West Indies, even into Europe. Um, let us um, continue to remember that as we move forward. We also know for a fact that there were enslaved uh, indigenous peoples who um, worked, um, who were enslaved by the Van Cortlands and worked on this property. Even though it was illegal to enslave um, indigenous people from specific groups during that time, um, we just don't know where these specific people were from or if it was just a completely ignoring the laws of the time. And um, enforcement of said laws were always spotty when it came to treaties. Next slide. So something that we know more of recently, thanks to DNA, um, to DNA testing, of African American populations here in America is we have a idea of where in where these enslaved persons were being kidnapped from. Um, we're also looking at slave ships and their logs where they were um, picking up their human cargo along the coastline in West Africa, South Africa and East Africa, Lower East Africa. So um, we don't know the ethnic groups of the people, but we can get an idea from where the majority of these people are coming from. So as you can see, a lot of people from uh, places like um, Guinea, Gambia, uh, Nigeria, the Gold Coast, Togo, Benin, um, Gabon, Angola. So, uh, and one thing that really surprised me was that we know um, that there were references to Jacobus Van Cortland. So he's the first Van Cortland to own the property in the late 1600s. Um, he mentions Madagascar and he sends, he arranged about five voyages to Madagascar with goods to trade with pirates for enslaved Africans. So a good guess is that um, some of these people are coming from Madagascar as well. That's something that surprised me. Um, also, uh, 
Van Cortlandt's did intermarry in Jamaica. So it is, it was very common for um, enslaved persons to come to North America from the West Indies and not directly from uh, West Africa. We know that um, in quote, they preferred enslaved persons who were seasoned for service. Uh, only about two fifths of New York enslaved population came directly from Africa. So that meant a large percent of the, them came from the West Indies. Um, there are some guesswork that uh, a lot of the people in the area were Asante, but this is all guesswork, of course. Next slide. So, um, George Murdoch was a anthropologist and he made a map of thousands of African ethno-linguistic groups. I always hesitate in using this map because it is not accurate. Um, the, the slave trade um, and just the nomadic nature of some groups uh, really changed the ethnic makeup of Africa, but Africa is the most ethnically diverse continent on earth. Um, there are thousands of ethnic groups, and I find that this is the closest we're going to get to a ethnic map, but I really wanted to put out there um, that there are a lot of problems in um, George Murdoch's um, ethnic map, but this is a close as close as we can get at this moment. Um, so of course, some groups split, some joined together, some were completely wiped out uh, due to enslavement uh, and a portion, uh, as I said before, were nomadic. So please keep that in mind. But I really, really wanted to really illustrate how diverse, ethnically diverse Africa is. Next slide. I want you all to listen to a few numbers about slavery in New York. 16% of New Yorkers, the colony as a whole, um, were enslaved in 1720. So that's 5,740. Uh, enslaved New Yorkers, and then 14% of all New Yorkers in 1750 were enslaved. That's 11,000 um, enslaved persons in New York, the colony. In 1750, one in five New York, of New York City's inhabitants were Black. That's one in five in 1750. New York City was one of the largest slave owning populations. Half of New York City's households had one or more enslaved persons. Let me say that once again, half of New York City's households had one or more enslaved persons. And I think it's important to understand uh, culturally these differences um, because this means that enslaved persons in New York City are not so much grouped together. They're being isolated in households. So um, whereas if we're looking at plantations, which absolutely did exist in New York, uh, where there was larger groupings of enslaved persons, in the city, they were more so spread apart. Next slide. Now I want to really jump into the laws of Africans in, in New York specifically. Um, so what are some of the laws that um, were, guy, were impacting their lives? So of course we start with Dutch rule. I don't find that there was a lot of uh, Dutch laws has specifically about uh, the enslaved community, but that does not mean um, that there 
because there weren't laws passed in the code that there weren't customs followed under Dutch rule um, that impacted in the enslaved community as well as the free black community. But in 1640, a Dutch law passed only Europeans were allowed to become skilled tradesmen like carpenters or bricklayers. And I think I need to point out that this enforcement was spotty because we do see that there were um, absolutely African tradespeople. Now we're gonna take a look at under British rule. In 1681, in a series of laws, enslaved were forbidden to leave their enslavers house without permission. They could not own weapons. They could not gather in groups larger than four. Whites and free blacks could not entertain enslaved persons in their house, in their homes, sell them liquor or take goods or money from them. 1692, enslaved persons who made noise in the streets on Sundays could be whipped. 1702, enslaved persons could not gather in groups larger than three, 40 lashes on the neck and back for offenders. Enslavers were free to punish their enslaved for any misdeed, however they chose, short of killing them or cutting off their limbs. 1706, any child born to an enslaved mother was an enslaved person for life, would be enslaved for life. 1708, any, I'm sorry, 1707, newly free Blacks could not own or inherit land. 1708, any enslaved person who murdered his or her enslaver or conspired to do so would face a horrible death. Next slide. 1712. So um, there was a uh, slave revolt in 1712 and um, the British organized and restated earlier laws to form what was called the Black Code. Among the rules, it reaffirmed any enslaved person convicted of conspiring to revolt against white people would suffer a horrible death no enslaved person could ever own a gun or pistol. No black person who became free after 1712 could own a house or pass belongings on to children. No enslaved person could be freed without a 200 pound bond being paid in case the former enslaved person became a public charge. 1713, no enslaved person over the age of 14 could be out at night without a lantern by which they could be plainly seen. 1722, black funerals had to be held during daylight. 1731, enslaved persons were not permitted to gamble for money. Enslaved persons who rode a horse rec recklessly or fast within the city could be whipped. No more than 12 enslaved persons could assemble for a funeral they would be chosen by the dead enslaved person's enslaver. Uh, so this means that no more than 12 enslaved persons could gather for their brethren's funeral and that those who gathered had, were chosen by the enslaver. Black people, I'm sorry, 1742, black people were permitted from, uh, prohibited from fetching water on Sundays unless the well was next to their enslaver's home. Every household was required to keep watch for suspicious nighttime behavior of enslaved persons. Last, 1773, white residents were required to take any enslaved person found in the streets after dark to be whipped. I just want one, that to sink, sink in just a little bit, all of these laws. Um, and I just stopped um, right at the colonial period. I didn't go further into um, the New York as a state because there would be more laws. Next slide. Now fo focusing on the Van Court, 
Cortland estate. So this is a section of a map from uh, 1781. And it shows the detail around Van Cortland Park. Um, and so the history of enslavement on this property is a long one. And it began around the mid 1600s and ended in um, the 1820s. So enslavement on this site spanned quite a long period of time, 200 years nearly. The first local census in 1698 recorded the names of four enslaved um, persons enslaved here by Jacobus Van Cortland. Their names were Heder, Tone, Mark, and Hester. So Jacobus Van Cortland was a wealthy New York City merchant and a two-time mayor of New York City. He purchased small farms um, here from local colonists in the late 1600s. Um, and he was an absentee landlord. This isn't unheard of. It was a common practice throughout the East Coast uh, for wealthy families to um, have overseers drive enslaved workers out to own land and then clear it and make it profitable. Then they would later build a house on it um, if they so choose. That is exactly what we see here with the Van Cortlands um, or Yonkers Plantation. An overseer worked the enslaved people on this property, bringing in considerable profits to the Van, Van Cortland household. I view this property as a plantation or a forced labor camp. Even though it was not as common to see plantation attached to northern land holdings, in this case, it is an accurate representation of the situation uh, for three main reasons. An enslaved labor force, um, the enslaver, the owner managed and didn't do actual physical agricultural labor, and it produced gold goods for international market and not just a local market. So this was not a mom and pop operation. They're not taking it to local markets. The goods produced here were shipped um, throughout the Atlantic. And so it's a very large operation. Next slide. I wanted us to take a closer look at the transatlantic trade um, because Jacobus Van Cortland was a very successful merchant. Um, New York City is New York City today because of the transatlantic uh, trade. His, his boats, so Jacobus Van Cortland's boats brought butter, flour, bacon, and lumber to Antigua, uh, Curacao, Jamaica, and Charleston then cornmeal, lumber, and cowhide to London. Then English spirits, Holland duck, household goods, money, rum, sugar, and enslaved persons came to New York on the return voyage. And so I think it's um, very important to state that uh, Jacobus Van Cortland made a lot of money and the Van Cortlands in general made a lot of money off of the transatlantic trade and specifically in supporting um, slavery in the West Indies and in trading enslaved persons. Give you a moment to take a look at the map. Next slide. So we don't know exactly when the house was built, but we're certain that it was built in stages. We don't know, but we do believe enslaved persons built this house. I am almost certain enslaved persons built this house. It was not uncommon for people to build a house and live in part of it while the rest was built out as needed, or parts could be built on as needed as well. In his will, Jacobus um, leaves the property as well as enslaved workers to his only son, Frederick Van Cortland, and that was in 1739. Frederick and his family 
wife Frances, sons James, Frederick, and Augustus, and daughters Anne and Eve were documented as living on the property by 1748. So Frederick's 1749 will lists 11 to 12 enslaved persons. So that's six men and five or six women. We say five or six women because there are two Hesters listed. Um, Hester was a very common uh, Dutch name. So I think that it's very plausible that there were two Hesters. Um, so one of the Hesters was married to Piero and Piero was a miller and Hester and Piero had a son, Peter. And I believe that Peter most likely would have apprenticed with his father in the grist mill. And there was Levely, the boatman and Caesar who is listed as being indigenous and Caesar had a wife, Kate. And then there were two boys, uh, two children. We don't know who their parents were, uh, Klaus and Frankie. Next slide. So um, these are two images that I am quite fond of on the left. Um, this is a family portrait by Deborah Goldsmith. This is 1832. Um, and I think that you will note um, the black woman in the background. I do not know if this woman was free or enslaved at the time of this painting, um, but she is clearly um, caring for, a, for the children here. And then on the right, we have Miss Breen Jones by John Rose. Uh, this is circa 1785. And these are both um, women working in the household. We know Miss Breen jo Jones on the right was enslaved. So the household was run by enslaved servants. Uh, remember that this house was built before plumbing and enslaved servants were responsible for the running of the household. No plumbing meant that fresh water had to be carried to the house and wastewater carried out. Can I tell you? I don't know if you all have been to Van Cortlandt House Museum. I would absolutely encourage you to go, but it is a long trip up the stairs. So if you're carrying buckets of water or if you are carrying wood up and down the stairs, because um, in winter enslaved servants were chopping trees, stacking wood, they carried in wood, carried up two to three flights of stairs and they maintained the fires throughout the building. So it is a lot of physical work. They are preparing and serving food, their personal enslaved servants, um, wealthy, um, wealthy merchants such as the Van Cortlands most likely aren't even dressing themselves. So putting on their shirts, their uh, gowns, they would have enslaved personal body slaves for that. Then there's a lot of cleaning to do. And as a living historian, I have um, cleaned houses like this in a period manner and it is the most exhausting work I have ever done in my life. So dusting, washing floors by hand, making beds, airing out rooms, washing windows, beating rugs, polishing silver, polishing wood furniture, laundry. Laundry lasts two to three days. And then of course, childcare. Um, I am not, I do not know if enslaved women, um, in New York were breastfeeding um, their enslavers children, but it is plausible. I just, I just personally don't know, but I do know it was common practice um, throughout the South. And then of course, diaper changes, caring for sick and elderly. These are just a constant a constant in living in 18th century. Next slide.
So these are the parade grounds. Um, it was a National Guard encampment during World War I. Um, but these fields today, I'm sure that you all have, if you live in New York, you probably passed by it, you've probably seen a game, um, all types of uh, little league, um, baseball, um, even cricket goes on here. But during the time, these are fields where um, things like wheat and corn were being grown. I, it, I know it's very hard to, when looking at a very beautiful scene as um, the parade grounds at Van Cortland Park, to think of this as a plantation, but this is what it was. Next slide. I have here a portion of the Van Bergen overmantle, and this is 1733, is um, painted by John Heaton. Um, this is the Cooperstown New York Historical Society that has this painting. I would definitely take a look online um, and look at the full overmantle. There's so much detail there. Um, it's probably one of the only known images of enslaved Africans in early 18th century New York working in agriculture and livestock on a Dutch plantation. So very specific. Uh, that's why I think it's really amazing to have this piece. It's just a tiny little piece of the puzzle um, that we can put in to see a more clear view. Um, it's believed to show enslaved Africans, enslaved Native Americans, and indentured servants as well. Um, enslaved workers tended many acres of crops such as wheat, buckwheat, corn, potatoes, and rye. Uh, they raised farm animals including cows, pigs, sheep, turkeys, and geese. This was very hard work on the large scale. Remember that Van Cortlands are not just local farmers. This is a capitalist enterprise. Um, there would have been quotas that needed to be met and a lot of pressure in meeting those goals. Um, I'm making another guess in that there would have been a dairy because um, if you look up at uh, Phillipsburg Manor in the Hudson Valley, um, they had a dairy and they were also transporting butter. But uh, we do know that that was a, um, a cottage industry in the area as well. So uh, people were making butter in their homes and selling it. So who knows? Uh, but I'm just making a guess that I don't think that um, Jacobus or Frederick would uh, leave money on the table like that. and. Um, Butter is easy money. Uh, next slide. So here we have the Colonial Road. Um, we know now that most roads throughout New York during the colonial period were constructed um, in part and maintained by, um, in part by slave labor. That's because the colonial government did not have its own road construction crews. I'm sure that you all, <laughs> as you're moving through the streets, see our construction crews in their um, orange vest. Uh, there was none of that. Uh, local people were required to provide the labor to build and maintain roads. Uh, the the uh, local assembly would say, hey, we need this road, um, Joe, Frederick, over here, um, you need to provide the labor. Uh, but I doubt, so local farmers, most likely it's them, maybe their sons, and if they owned an enslaved person or two, they would also be um, aiding in the labor as well. Um, but I just don't see the Van Cortlands um, who aren't even dressing themselves in the morning out here building a road. Um, so most likely wealthy people like the Van Cortlands would have had their enslaved persons um, uh, building their portions of the road in their area. Next slide. So I really, um, I, I think that this image really illustrates um, a clearing an area. 
So these women, um, this is an image called An Overseer Doing His Duty Near Fredericksburg, Virginia by Benjamin Henry Latrobe, circa 1798. Um, and these women are clearing stumps. Um, so they're burning, but they're also having to kind of um, get the get the roots out. Um, they're probably going to be attaching the stumps to um, something to pull them out, but this is very hard labor. So these women are clearing woods for tobacco planting. Um, but it's the same process. And remember, there are no backhoes, there are no power tools. So this is all done uh, with backbreaking uh, labor. So cutting down trees, removing stumps, and carrying all this materials away. And if you stop by the uh, Colonial Road, um, so it's in the back of the house, you will also see that there are stones laid down and there are also stone, there's actually a stone uh, wall on the side. And so all of that had to be carried in as well. Next slide. So this is the Van Cortlandt millstone. Um, originally it would have been a part of um, a mill that was constructed, well, that Jacobus Van Cortland had constructed on Tibbetts Brook. Um, and that was probably around the early 1700s. At the time, the property was managed by a local overseer and the work was performed by enslaved persons. Um, most likely the mill was constructed using enslaved labor. So there were two mills one of these mills was a sawmill for where fallen trees would be cut into buildable lumber, which was a big industry. Um, this would, this lumber would have been shipped throughout um, the Atlantic. And then of course, a grist mill. So turning grain into flour. And um, I really love this illustration on the right. It is a Piro and his son. So Piero the Miller, who was an enslaved man owned by Jacobus Van Cortland. Um, in the 18th century, uh, grist mills were a very sophisticated piece of machinery and it needed a skilled miller to operate it and maintain it. Um, at Van Cortland, that person was most certainly Piero. Uh, he had to know exactly how to reg regulate the flow of water um, from the mill pond by controlling the gate. Um, the miller also poured grain into the hole in the center of the runner and the grooves in the stone with scissor to cut the grains into flour. The grooves pushed the flour out from the center where it was collected at the end in the chute. Piro would have interacted also with neighbors um, who would have brought neighboring farmers who would have brought their flour, I mean, their uh, wheat berries um, and their corn to turn into meal or into flour. And he would have um, had to determine how much to charge. So most likely, I'm thinking that he would have been learned in some form or fashion, um, knowing mathematics, um, maybe reading and writing as well. Uh, he was also uh, charged with maintaining the mill. So if you look at this uh, millstone, the grooves had to be recut, so it had to be taken out, um, and then using hand carving tools. And these are very precise measurements. Um, ch uh, chipping off too much could really um, cause a problem for the entire mill. Um, the stone also had to be repositioned. It involves setting the runner stone less than a width of a seed apart from the bedstone, um, but without letting the stones touch. And so that meant that he had to remove the stones from the mechanism that weighed over a thousand pounds. So this is very precise work and he had to be very skilled to do this. Next slide. Okay, so uh, my secret is that I'm obsessed with mills, with gross mills. And so <laughs> I could not resist uh, showing you a video from um, 
from my trip to Mount Vernon Square Mill last year. So um, I just wanted to show you a little bit of what a running grist mill looks like. So um, grist mills look deceptively simple from the outside. So I really wanted to show you um, all of those very intricate pieces that are constantly in motion. Um, and being one inch, one centimeter off in measurements could actually uh, break the grist mill. So, um, I think it's really hard to really understand how intricate the measurements are here. Next slide. And so running the grist mill is the uh, water from the mill pond. So uh, Van Cortlandt Lake, as it is um, called by many, is actually a man-made body of water. Um, and it's fed by the hillstones of Yonkers, Tibbetts Brook, flows through there um, and it continues south into Kingsbridge where it's emptied into the Harlem River. Um, the mills here were powered by the current of the Tibbet, of Tibbetts Brook. But we know in 1732, Jacobus um, purchased additional land here from George Tibbetts for the purpose of creating a mill pond. Which was prov which provided more reliable power for the mill. So um, Jacobus ordered that the brook be dammed, and the land on either side of the brook was flooded to create the mill pond. And we know for a fact that it was enslaved African labor, um, certainly performing the hard work of building the dam. Um, if you have a chance to make it to look at the, um, the lake or the pond at behind Van Cortland, it, it looks like inconceivable that this was done by, um, that this was man-made before the time of backhoes. Um, and we know for a fact that it was enslaved Africans um, who did this. Um, I think also including the enslaved persons he owned, I think that he also most likely rented out enslaved persons from elsewhere to help with the labor of this. So this is, um, these are two images of the mill pond. This is our early, the one on the left um, is from the early 20th century and the one on the right. Um, it's just very shocking that it looks this peaceful um, and what we know actually went on at that mill pond. Next slide. So how did all of this get to um, Manhattan? Remember the grain and the usable lumber Piero, the enslaved miller produced. Um, so he produced that from there, these goods were loaded onto a boat and Levin Lee, who was an enslaved boat pilot, navigated the boat on Tibbetts Brook through the salt marshes of Kingsbridge, then to the Harlem River and then to the East River and on to Lower Manhattan. So that is how um, they got all of these goods uh, from all the way up here, from all the way in the Bronx down to Lower Manhattan to be put on ships to move throughout uh, the Atlantic. Next slide. So we believed 
we believe that enslaved persons were buried here in this space advanced to the Kingsbridge burial ground. Um, I'm excited to say that um, there will now be uh, signs posted um, to point out that this is an African burial ground. We believe that the enslaved persons who lived, worked, and died here on Van Cortland Plantation were buried here. We know there's a few reasons, even though there aren't any records survived that said specifically this is an African burial ground. We know that colonists were buried at adjacent Kingsbridge burial ground from the 1600s, which we know historically um, African burial grounds are usually adjacent um, to uh, white burial grounds. Um, there's a historic black community in Kingsbridge, which was about 20% of the neighborhood's total population at its peak just after the American Revolution. Um, in 1870s, workers unearthed skeletons in the area while working on construction of the New York and Northern Railroad. In 1879, a local man, Caleb Van Tassel, recalled making a coffin for a slave who was buried here. In 1935, J.D. James, who spent his youth around Van Cortlandt Lake, wrote in his memoir that a great number of skeletons of former slaves were unearthed here during the railroad's construction. And then in 2019, USDA geophysical study of the old Putman Trail using ground penetrating radar identified what was described as fine linear features which resemble coffins. So um, we can do a good estimation that we do believe that this is an African burial ground. I do have to say we don't know anything about these people beyond the uh, ground penetrating radar. Um, so we're relying on some information uh, that we've gotten from the African burial ground in lower Manhattan. There has been a lot of research done on the remains of those ancestors. Um, so we can make some estimations about what we would see here for these enslaved persons. For example, in the lower Manhattan burial ground, uh, we see many injuries. Um, from work-related injuries, stress fractures. Um, in the skull, we see um, indentations on the skull from carrying heavy loads on the heads. We see bowing of the limbs of children, which point to hard labor. We also see shroud, a lot of shroud pins found in two-thirds of the bodies many are women, children, and infants. We can estimate that many of the enslaved persons uh, buried here would have been children because that's a, who was, a lot of who was buried at the African burial ground in lower Manhattan. We found wound cloth, cloth, um, wound cloth which is common in Africa, so an estimate that many of them were buried in shrouds. Copper rings, there was most common are glass beads. Then we found offerings, coins, shells, pipes, knives. We can guess that most likely there would have been ritual in the burying of these people, drumming, chants and dancing. We can also guess that there most likely would have been body washing, that these people would have been, um, if allowed by enslavers, these people would have been cared for deeply by their community, washed and shrouded and buried. But we don't know exactly what specific rituals were done here on this site. But looking at other sites, we can have an idea. Next slide.
we know that the people here resist it. Here we have a runaway ad of Andrew Saxon. This is from the New York Gazette, September 17, 1733. He was enslaved uh, by Jacobus Van Cortland. He was a carpenter and a cooper. And he reached for his liberty. You see here. There was a slave rebellion in 1712. 23 enslaved Africans in lower Manhattan killed nine white folks and injured another six before they were stopped. More than three times the number of black people, 70 were arrested and jailed. Of these, 27 were put on trial and 21 convicted and executed. There was also a supposed uh, slave rebellion plot of 1741, but there's a lot of debate over whether or not that was an actual um, plot or not, or it was the paranoia of a population who um, it had enslaved persons. And we know that they sabotaged, they broke tools, they ran away temporarily or permanently they forged passes and they hid children from being in, from being sold. We know this. We have this documentation. They resisted. Next slide. And they held on to their culture. We have here trade beads, uh, decorative glass beads used between 16th and 20th century as a money token for goods. This was fashioned into uh, beaded necklaces and waist beads and became a part of West African culture after contact with early Europeans. Then you see the love and care between one another. The, this is a ring. This earring here was found by the jawbone of a boy. This is silver, which is pure money during the time. So I imagine someone put this in his ear, someone who cared for him. They held on to their culture and they had underground markets buying and selling goods they were not allowed to have, but they persisted. Next slide. They were both culturally West African and Dutch. A uh, biggest example of that is Pinkster, a holiday that was celebrated for several days by African and Dutch New Yorkers throughout the 1700s, basically Pentecost in Dutch. Enslaved persons sometimes would travel to reunite with family and friends. There was uh, dancing and they would congregate even though this was a time of rest and a time to get together, a time when roles were flipped, they were still enslaved. We can get an idea of West African and Dutch culture and how it melded together by looking at Dutch, um, by looking at other Dutch colonies such as Curaçao and Aruba. And of course, someone we know dear, Sojourner Truth, who was African Dutch. Next slide. I wanted to end here in the quarters. I always wonder what they were thinking when they lay in bed right before sleep took them or in the early mornings when they were probably about to get up to go to work. This was probably the only time they had that was solely theirs, those moments in bed. Maybe they're sitting next, laying next to their loved one, or maybe a child has, their child has woken up early and crawled on top of them and do what those children do, that weird thing where they put their fingers underneath your nose to see if you're alive or dead. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I always wonder if, if they had experiences like that or 
what did they whisper to their husband or wife, wife before bed? Were they talking about, oh, did you see that silly thing your son did this morning? Or were they talking about their enslavers? Or what are those everyday things that they were talking about? Did they just have those moments where they shared an inside joke and had a good laugh? Or sometimes did they hold each other and cry? Those are the things that I think about. Did they know that their very blood, sweat, and tears would be the fuel that was fed into the engine that built New York City? No further. It laid the economic and physical foundation of the United States of America. It was them. Regardless of if they knew how big of an operation their enslavers made them a part of, it cannot be denied that New York City would not be a financial and trading center if it hadn't been for the products of slave labor. Thank you. If anyone has any questions for me, it's a Q&A time. I know I went a bit over my time. Thank you, Cheney. If folks are shy, they can, um, but want to ask questions, please put them in the chat. Hey, Cheney, Drea here, a long time fan. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, as you've been researching, you know, slavery and plantations in New York and, you know, what are some of the things that surprised you the most or that you weren't expecting to find? Because there is this mythology of the Northeast, you know, oh no, it never happened here. So I just want to know since, you know, you've been at this for a very, very long time, what findings surprised you? I think the biggest thing that surprised me was just the scale of it. I mean, you know, I had, I think I had always known that there was slavery in New York, but I had this kind of idea that it was just, you know, a handful of enslaved persons, but the scale was just massive in New York. It was just, I mean, if you look at New York City, they were only second to Charleston, South Carolina as in slave owning. Um, so it was just, it was just so mind boggling. And um, then also that there were plantations like, yeah, I knew there was slavery, but like actual plantations, like even though they may not call it um, a plantation. I mean, the criteria for a plantation is there, whether or not they call it a plantation. Um, if slave labor, the um, person who owns the um, owns the estate is not actually doing the physical labor, and it's for it's a large scale operation. Cheney, there's a question. Um, were they allowed to marry at Van Cortland? So the, under Brit British rule, um, law, property cannot be legally married because um, enslaved persons were property under the law. So, um, property cannot legally be married to one another. Um, so legally they were, could not marry. I do absolutely do believe that they were married because in the, um, I'm sorry, in the uh, will, you do see someone, Piero is husband to Hester. So, um, they were married, but I think that it wasn't a legally binding marriage. Jenny, there's another question. Can you talk a little bit more about Pinkster? Oh, yay, Pinkster. <laughs> okay. 
I, I try not to go, I would go down the rabbit hole of Pinkster if you let me. <laughs> so, um, so Pinkster is, it started out as a, um, it's Dutch for Pentecost. And so it's this interesting period in New York when um, the Dutch, after, after New Amsterdam becomes New York and it changes hands from the Dutch to the British, the Dutch that are there go through this process of being Anglicized. So they're with the, by the next generation, they're not so much, not as Dutch. Um, so they're picking up a lot more British customs. They're still, they still probably speak Dutch at home, but um, they're very much British by the time we go from Jacobus to Frederick. Um, and so as that shifts, you see customs like Pinkster slowly leaving um, the common, um, leaving the common household, Dutch households. Um, so I would say by the American Revolution, um, you kind of see this switch from a lot of a lot of Dutch are swinging over fully into becoming Anglicized and going fully into um, American. They want to be American, American, and um, so you see by the end of the 18th century, Africans are taking on Pinkster full force, and so that's when you see a lot hear a lot of Pinkster Hill in. Um, I am pulling a whole blank, a whole blank. I am sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> um, um, Pinkster Hill and these very large um, celebrations in upstate New York, as well as in New York, enslaved persons coming from far and wide to come together, to interact with one another, um, to have, um, to meet with people they haven't seen in a long time, to dance, to there's a kind of uprooting or a turning over of the roles. There is a pinkster king that is selected from among the enslaved men. Um, and it's also, it's interesting because I thought that it had turned into a full like African festival and it was just like black folks, but no, this was very uh, interracial affair. You would have seen Dutch, um, English, um, you would have seen indigenous persons also selling goods as well. So it would have been a very big affair. Um, please come to, uh, I, I'm going to speak it now into reality, come to Dutch uh, 2022 at Van Cortlandt. Um, they're, they're going to do it up right. <laughs> We're going to do something. Yes, we are. We're going to have a, a big joint effort with um, Van Cortlandt Park Alliance and with Van Cortlandt House Museum. And we're going to, uh, with Cheney, of course, we're going to have a big pinkster um, kind of a celebration. So, so look for that. Uh, I have a question from Alicia Miller Peterson. Um, it's very interesting. I'm going to read it. It's a long question. It's, a very, it's very interesting about the enslaved people coming from the Caribbean to New York State and particularly New York City. There is a large Afro-Caribbean population in the Bronx. Are you familiar with additional research tied to the Van Cortlandt story and Afro-Caribbeans in the Bronx? It's an interesting tie-in, like how many, like how people land in spaces that they weren't familiar uh, to a slave history tied to said group. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think it's so funny tell, talking to Afro-Caribbeans and being like, I could totally be your cousin <laughs> because um, even though I'm descended from American enslaved persons um, from the 18th century, um, most likely my ancestors did not come directly from Africa, but they probably spent maybe some time in um, the West Indies before being um, put further on a ship and uh, brought up to North America. Um, I, I'm so sorry, there were two parts to that question. 
you want me to read the second part to you? Yes, please. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no worries. Um, okay, so are you familiar with additional research tied to the Van Cortlandt story and Afro-Caribbeans in the Bronx? Uh, and then uh, it's an interesting tie in how many um, like how people land in spaces that they weren't familiar to a slave history tied to said group. Yes, um, I do not have any more research specifically beyond. Um, we do know specifically that Jacobus Van Cortland, where he was sending expeditions to trade with um, pirates off the coast of Madagascar for enslaved persons. Um, I wish we knew, I would say yes, actually. Um, they, there was a lot of intermarrying of the Van Cortlands in Jamaica. So um, I would also guess that there possibly was some crossover, but of course we don't have that documentation unless we find it. <laughs> I, I just want to say, I'm Alicia and I thank you. I just want to say this one last thing <clears throat> to tie in. The reason why I made that big point about the landing in spaces, I'll give you an example. Um, I grew up in Queens, New York, and mm -hmm. I never knew that my my maternal grandmother, who I actually lived in the same two family house with in Queens, when I got my one of my first apartments in Manhattan, and I told her where I moved to, she's like, "Oh, we used to live one block away from there." Now I never had a conversation with the grandmother, my grandparents, and my parents. We all lived in one home in Queens. I'm like twenty something years old, almost thirty, and I tell her I'm moving to like West Hundred and Thirteenth Street, like in the nineties. And she's like, oh, we used to live down the block. So my point is that sometimes you land in a space that is familiar to your soul, but you don't even know why you're there. So that's Absolutely. the tie-in that I was thinking of when mm -hmm. I, I thought about all these um, Caribbean, Afro-Caribbeans, particularly on the number two train line on the other side of Van Cortland. And they there's a large concentration of families that just come and that's been their home for like, I guess at least 80, 80 years or better. So yeah, it's yeah, probably longer so and I don't know. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, I think that that's a connection that we can bring to the forefront today. Um, we need to make those present connections because sometimes uh, people say, I have no connection with this site. And I'm like, oh, but wait. <laughs> Oh, but wait, we do. So there's a couple more questions, if, if that's okay, Cheney. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Uh, since slavery was so present in New York in the 18th and early 19th century, how do these uh, wealthy enslavers feel about the eventual abolition? Do you know anything about that? How did um, the... the with the gradual emancipation? Yeah. Well, it, it all depends. Um, so I've kind of been looking at court cases, um, people like Sojourner Truth who was trying to retrieve her child um, because there were laws that were passed that um, at the end of enslavement with the gradual emancipation, uh, new enslaved persons could not be brought in and enslaved persons in New York could not be sold out of New York. But we know for a fact that those laws sometimes were not followed. Um, if we, we do know that there was kind of a shift in the number of black folks in New York at the end of enslavement, um, we can make a guess that some of these enslaved persons um, were sold. Um, and unless there was um, someone who knew them and made a big fuss, for example, Sojourner Truth, um, a lot of these people were just lost. Um, we have to ask ourselves, who was enforcing that law? Who was recording every enslaved person and saying, Oh yeah, Joe was here or uh, Levely was here in uh, 1798 and now he just disappeared. You know, you know he you know he got kicked by a horse. He got kicked by a horse and he just, you know, he died. So um, 
So that's, I think that we should remember that, that um, these people held financial value. They were property. And the idea that someone is just going to allow uh, someone who purchased a human being is just going to allow their property to just depreciate overnight into nothing. I'm still, I'm doing, I'm doing research right now into that. So I'm working on it. Thank you for bringing that up. Wow. And I think this is the last question. Uh, was all the corn and wheat grown on the plantation or brought from other farms? Did the plantation and enslaved workers extend far beyond the rocky land of the park? I don't know. Um, the, did they extend where they, were they working outside of the park, that area? Um, that's what I think, that's what I think this means. I don't know. Um, I, I, I couldn't even, I, I'm sure my educated guess is that people were being rented out elsewhere, but I have no, I have no documentation to back out, back up what I'm saying. Um, but it was just looking at the Van Cortlands, um, they were very smart business people and they are squeezing every little any out of their property. So we have a little bit of extra information. The Van Cortlands held land about twice as large as today's park. And the park is 1146 acres. So that's quite a bit. And there would have been corn and wheat brought to the mill by smaller farms who didn't have their own mills for milling. And that is coming to us from Van Cortland House Museum uh, museum's own Laura Carpenter Myers, who is the director of the museum. So, also, uh, tenants would pay um, their rent also in, mm. in in flour as well. So, um, that too. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Can we have a round of applause <laughs> for Cheney? <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much. Oh, and there will be many more programs coming to us from, um, from Van Cortland Park Alliance, also from Van Cortland House Museum. We hope to have Cheney McKnight back with us again for more programming. And she's not your mama's history. In the chat, you can see there's um, information about Cheney's Patreon. And there's also information about Van Cortland Park Alliance. If you want to see more programs like this, we would love for you to support us. Uh, so go to vancortland.org uh, and you can, you can support our programs, which would be really, really wonderful. Uh, we're doing a lot. There's gonna be, the signs were unveiled this weekend and they will be installed over the summer. So the lake will now be known as Hester and Piero's Mill Pond. Yep, yep. Very exciting. And the, and the burial ground will be the enslaved African and Kingsbridge burial grounds. So two new signs coming as a result of our work um, of the Enslaved People Project Task Force. Yay! Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.